All right, so we'll start off with uh, taking a cursory overview of the 90 to 100 day rainfall um, and percent of normal rainfall as of March 7th, which was yesterday. And you can see, um, as far as the 90 day rainfall goes, <clears throat> pretty much the entire area of South Central Texas has been below normal. Um, even the Rio Grande Plains, which had a pretty wet fall, um, has been dry over the last 90 days. Uh, most other areas have been about 50 to 90 percent of normal for the fall and the winter. So uh, we're, we're pretty much looking uh, below normal in terms of precipitation here over the last 90, especially 90 days, maybe 180 days for the vast majority of the area. So uh, looking at right now, uh, the latest uh, update from the drought monitor, uh, you can see we've had a little bit of improvement from the most recent run. Uh, we're only at the uh, <laughs> D0 and D1, we got rid of those small little isolated areas of D2. However, uh, the drought is expected to persist and actually may intensify. Uh, as far as those, uh, those D0 locations, um, we expect those to join uh, the rest of the, uh, the areas that are currently in D1 drought. So we, we expect those D0s to become D1 uh, sometime here in the near future. Um, so again, right now, we're still looking at uh, drought conditions across pretty much the entirety of, uh, well, at least abnormally dry to be zero in the rest. Uh, 71 percent of our area here is, is currently in D1 um, in drought. So we still have uh, La Nina conditions present, uh, but it's slowly weakening. The December through February ONI average was negative 0.9 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, the East Pacific SSTs are, are warming, uh, but the January through March ONI will be uh, less than or equal to about negative 0.5 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, but one thing to note on the bottom left there, you can see that the uh, the subsurface cold SECT anomalies are, are gone. Uh, so again, uh, La Nina is still present, but uh, it's slowly weakening. So what we expect, uh, most models predict La Nina will become ENSO neutral by the end of spring. So uh, La Nina will, will be gone, will be back to ENSO neutral uh, by the end of the spring. Um, and as far as going out beyond that, uh, model predictability for late summer and fall is, is pretty low. Um, so uh, you know, don't put a whole lot of stock in, in the pronostications for, uh, for, for beyond that. Uh, the CPC is predicting a 55% chance of La Nina transitioning to L into neutral layer this spring. So again, just showing you um, what CPC has. All right, looking at some of the more short-term stuff here, the, the 6 to 10 day and then the 18 to 14 day outlooks. Um, you can see precipitation on the left um, and temperatures on the right. Uh, we're looking at, at least the 6 to 14 day, um, looking at uh, drier and cooler than normal weather expected uh, behind the, the front that's coming this weekend before warming up by the end of next week. Um, so again, 6 to 10 day temperature is looking at uh, slightly below, higher probability for slightly below normal than uh, beyond that 8 to 14 day warming back up again. And then precipitation being uh, a little bit uh, below normal or around, uh, around neutral. And then moving forward to uh, the month of March outlooks and then the spring outlooks, March, April, May. Um, odds are strongly tilted towards a warmer and drier than normal spring. Uh, the, the March rainfall actually may be closer to normal. And then looking at the temperatures again, both for March and especially for March through May, you can see uh, trending toward a higher probability for warmer than normal temperatures. Uh, something that Climate Prediction Center is, is doing, uh, it's an experimental product. They're uh, looking at uh, three and four week outlooks. Um, so again, this is experimental precipitation and operational temperature outlooks that are released every Friday um, for uh, three to four week outlooks here. Um, and you can see that it's predicting our area to be warmer than normal. Um, actually two categories of above or below normal average temperature and precipitation for weeks three to four. So again, looking at on three to four week scale here, looking at uh, the probability of, of warmer temperatures and drier. Okay. All right, so this is another uh, outlook that uh, I haven't really shown you guys before. And it's, it's also an experimental outlook, but this gives you kind of a sense of, of what type of hazards you may see uh, really from days three to 14. And of course, uh, the day three to seven hazards within the first week are going to be more confident than the week two day to eight, day eight to 14 hazards. Uh, but of course, the uh, Climate Prediction Center is working to improve this, uh, particularly by doing a, a more probabilistic product 
which is what they're currently doing right now uh, for their uh, rainfall, uh, for the heavy rainfall maps as it is anyway, and I believe they're going to be doing that for wind and for uh, temperature moving forward as well. But again, here you can just click on this part of the page. If you go back, you go to the, the front page uh, where you've got the three to four outlooks on the left. The hazards outlook is right to the right of that. And then you can get this interactive map where you can click on precipitation temperature soils and go all the way out to days 8 to 14, even with the probabilistic forecasts. And you know you can turn them on or turn it off depending on what you can see. So what you see right now for us is that aside from uh, severe drought or D2 conditions just touching Williamson County, we don't really have any uh, hazards that are expected of uh, significance in the next two weeks. It doesn't mean that they can't happen. It just means that CPC doesn't have strong confidence that they're going to happen within the next two weeks. As you can see that there are many areas of the country that are not just in drought, but places that have much below temperatures expected due to a pretty strong front that's coming through this weekend and a reinforcing front uh, the middle of next week. And then, of course, the, the possibility of some heavier rainfall moving into uh, the western United States uh, later in the period and also for uh, the southeastern United States. And, of course, you have to click on days 3, 8 to 7, and 8 to 14 to see that. So that's just kind of a way for you to maintain your situation awareness if you want to do it uh, on your own as the season goes on. Of course, we are entering spring, which is severe weather season here in South Central Texas. Uh, as you can see, we're, we are entering March, and our severe weather reports increase dramatically as you go from March, April, into May. And of course, hail reports make uh, the vast majority of the reports. We do get uh, some tornadoes, and we do get uh, some uh, wind reports here in green as well. But the red bars here really correspond with our, our most significant impact here in South Central Texas, which is hail and sometimes quite significant hills, as San Antonio knows over the past couple of years in other places as well. Uh, flash flooding is a threat that gradually increases through spring and becomes pretty significant as we get into May, and particularly in June and July, uh, and then it kind of trails off later in the year, but it's still pretty constant throughout the year. But really, this is the time of year, if you're new to this area, that we get uh, quite a bit of severe weather. And of course, if you look at tornadoes, uh, May is the most active a month for tornadoes in South Central Texas, but March is actually our second most active month, uh, just slightly above April and September. And so again, September is mostly due to tropical systems, but for actual severe weather, we get a lot of supercell thunderstorms capable of producing hail and damaging winds and tornadoes. It is this time of year, particularly in May. So that's when we really want to be uh, vigilant about that threat, uh, but also keep in mind that March and April are pretty active as well. I showed this last year because it was relevant, and it's relevant again this year. Uh, there's been a a recent study that was done a couple of years ago uh, by someone that works for NOAA uh, that basically shows that uh, if you learn an El Nino type of event, whether it's an El Nino that has continued for a couple of years or an El Nino that's quickly ending and going to La Nina, we, we don't tend to get a lot of severe weather, as you can see uh, from these yellows and, and oranges and reds that produce, that basically indicate the probability of a tornado outbreak, where red is actually close to 40 to 50 percent uh, for a tornado outbreak within that season uh, within 200 kilometers in a given year. Uh, and again, even when El Nino ends early, it's not big. So the key is El Nino is not really the severe weather signal. It's usually La Nina. We have two different kinds of La Nina. So we have one where we've got what we call a resurgent La Nina, where you had a La Nina that developed late in the spring last year and then maintained itself throughout the entire uh, spring and then redevelops into La Nina again uh, for the following fall into spring. And then we have something called transitioning La Nina, where we go from La Nina the previous year, continues a little bit in the spring, and then transitions out to El Nino uh, during the spring. We don't have a strong predictive signal when we're going to end to neutral conditions, which we may, but you know, even though we didn't highlight it much, there is a wide variety of solutions for where we may end up by fall. So some solutions, uh, the CFS model that CPC puts out in particular is suggesting we may go back to a weak La Nina for a third year in a row. And I do want to point out that that did happen the last time that we had a very strong El Nino back in 97, 98. It was followed by three La Ninas. Uh, but there are also some, a few models that show we're going to go to El Nino, and then the majority of models have us in so neutral. But regardless, the La Nina uh, signal is the one that typically is the one that produces the, the most significant tornado outbreaks we have in the United States. Of course, a lot of them are concentrated in the, in the Midwest and Southeastern and Mid-South uh, portions of the United States. But we do get some in the Southern Plains, particularly during the resurgent La Nina just to our north, and even sometimes a little bit further south. One thing I do want to highlight, and I highlighted this last year as well, 
is that uh, if we are in a resurgent La Nina pattern and it does materialize, we end up kind of looking like we're going to stay in La Nina, which is not too likely but could happen. Uh, you can see here that the probability of a tornado outbreak this far south into south central Texas for May does go up quite a bit. Uh, last year, that didn't really materialize because we were strongly capped. We had many, many opportunities to have pretty significant severe weather here last year, uh, but because we were stable, it didn't happen. But, you know, we may get the situation that happens again this year, and if we are stable, not much will happen. If we're unstable, then quite a bit will happen. So it will be very important to maintain an increasing amount of situational awareness as we go throughout the spring. One other thing I'd like to point out uh, that you can also kind of use uh, if you have questions about this product, uh, just give us uh, an email, either Brett or myself, uh, but again, uh, this is a situational awareness product that kind of gives you an idea of what is severe weather looking like over the next 45 days. Uh, when you look at this, what you're essentially seeing is anything that's really dark blue or even to some extent, you know, closer to light blue, those are, these, these are days that are not expecting a lot of severe weather. And you see that generally if we go from the center line right here in the center of the, of the graph and we go to the right, that's days increasing in time. And so, Today or yesterday was March 7th, and so we go forward with that. We can go all the way towards even the middle to late part of April as we go to the right. What you're seeing here is, generally speaking, over the next week or so, there's not much of a threat for severe weather virtually anywhere in the country. As we get beyond the first week, there's a slight threat of the severe weather, but you can see that if you look down, that shows you all the different forecasts that have been made for that. You can see that there's not a significant consistent signal like there was, say, back in late February and even early portions of March, where you have kind of a straight vertical line where it shows that for several days they were predicting that there'd be severe weather. So in the short term, this is something that kind of gives you an idea of if you're getting some greens and some yellows or even red, then you can see that, mm, that's kind of a period that could be pretty active. And then you'd actually want to click on image to see where the most activity is. Because as you see, as you get towards the uh, beginning of April, middle of April, we do have quite a bit of weather. So if you do happen to look at this, you'll see that for you know, the third week of, of March or fourth week of March, there's really not uh, a lot of threat for South Central Texas per these maps, because even though we do have the area in red that shows that you know, supercell thunderstorms would be possible if they developed, we don't have anything in blue that is actually showing us that there's going to be rain that occurs, I meaning we'll probably end up being capped. And so, of course, this could change in time, but what we really want to look for is where is the blue overlined with the red? Because the red says supercells are possible, that could produce quite a bit of severe weather, and the blue means that it could rain. So super elves could be possible, but probably not going to rain. But as we get towards the middle of April, uh, late, half, late part of March and first half of April, uh, we are starting to get those overlaid on each other, where we're getting you know, significant possibility of getting super cells, but also a significant possibility that we're going to have rain and, and showers and thunderstorms with them. Those are the things that you want to look for if you happen to look at these maps. But again, when you're going past the first seven to ten days, it's really just for trends of what do things look like they might look like. Now, you really can't take much in the way of details. Certainly, April does look a lot more active than March does this year. Uh, but in day seven uh, and less, you can certainly see that, which you'll see from the SPC outlooks as well. One other thing I want to kind of point out is that we have been working towards doing verification uh, of our previous outlooks. And this is also going to help us, particularly for severe weather, produce forecasts for future outlooks. Uh, if you look at this, what we've been doing, this is an example for severe weather. We essentially take eight different kind of predictors uh, for the particular season that occurred, and we see, you know, how do the reports rank? How do the report days rank? How, how did fatalities and injuries rank, tornado track, et cetera? And we take all these items and we rank them based on what they looked like relative to the 30-year 1981 to 2010 climatology. For, so for in this example, for the fall of 2015, we had 19 reports, and the value that was closest to that was 18 reports in 1997, and so that ranked ninth out of 30 years. And what you see in all these red things highlighted here is that almost every single one of these indicators in fall 2015 was in the top 10 of years, except for fatalities and injuries, thankfully. And so when you add all those together, and then you compare it to where it falls, whether it falls into the top 10 above normal years, or the middle 10 years, or the bottom 10 years, what you're seeing is that in this particular case, in fall 2015, we had those tornadoes that happened along with those floods. Uh, we actually had an above normal year for severe weather for the fall. Of course, in spring, we tend to be a lot more active, and so, you know, you've got ranging from the year that we had Gerald, Texas tornado in, in spring 1997, where we had 140 reports uh, and 28 fatalities mainly from that tornado, all the way down to a year where we might not have much at all. And so, uh, 
based on that, we've looked at what that looks like for this year. And it turns out of the five La Niñas that we have for spring, uh, where uh, we had a La Niña for the majority of spring, uh, you can see that three of the five La Niña springs did have above normal impacts for severe weather. And so based on that, even though the first you know, handful of weeks here doesn't look like it's going to be very active severe weather-wise, certainly historically the, the potential is there. So we're going to go with above normal impacts and increasing severe weather impacts through the season, particularly as you get into very late March, April, and May. Uh, another thing to point out is Jason Ringan has done local research here that shows that if you look at El Nino, La Nina in neutral years, La Nina years actually have the greatest number of severe weather events. I have neutral uh, circled because we may be neutral by the end of spring, but the middle one is La Nina. And what you see here is that for hail, we tend to have the most reports during La Nina. For tornadoes and for wind, we have a little bit more for, El Nino, for neutral years, but because we tend to have more hail reports than anything else, our most active severe weather seasons tend to be La Nina. And again, remember that the CFS model is suggesting that an active period of weather uh, for severe weather can begin by late March or early April. When we look at flooding, uh, again, La Nina here in the middle tends to have a lot fewer events and a lot fewer reports. And when we looked at uh, the previous five years for impacts, three of the five La Nina springs had below normal impacts, and none of them were above. The other two were, were near normal. And so we're not really expecting significant flooding issues this year. Of course, we could get you know isolated flood events here or there. It's, it's always possible here in South Central Texas. But going into spring, our stream, our stream flow anomalies, the river our stage height on our river levels are, are pretty low. Uh, so we don't have uh, really favorable antecedent conditions for doing flooding. And then as we move throughout the season, we're expecting to have a lot more severe weather, which may tie up a lot more of the precipitation in, in the form of hail and things like that. So we tend to stay dry in La Nina. That's what the forecast is. We're not really expecting significant uh, flooding impacts from hail. I mean, sorry, from, fl uh, from uh, flooding this year. And then finally, uh, fire weather is something that, thankfully, we had uh, a lot of rain in, in February. It didn't necessarily have above normal rainfall, but we were close enough to normal. We had several days of light rainfall and, and moist conditions that really kept our fuel moisture conditions and, and still to some extent have them uh, at least at normal levels, if not above normal levels, for a lot of the region. Uh, but we are going to start drying out as we get these uh, relatively dry fronts coming through here over the next week or, or so. Uh, and of course, what you're seeing here with the energy release levels is they actually were very, very low about a week ago, but they have already increased back to near normal levels uh, with just a week of kind of drier weather again. And as we kind of move throughout uh, the rest of the season, uh, if we do see another week or two of dry weather, they could start to increase even more. Uh, the significant wireland fire potential outlook uh, for actually March, April, and May is uh, for above normal uh, wildland fire potential, particularly for our southern and our western areas. Uh, March is actually just for our, our western and western hill country areas. Uh, but again, just this is kind of highlighting the fact that we may have a uh, greater than normal uh, chance to have above normal impacts for fire weather, particularly as we move throughout the fall season. And finally, just preview summer, uh, we will be doing another outlook for after the hurricane outlook comes out late in May uh, during the first half of June or so. And what you see here is that summer looks like the odds are tilted towards another very warm and hot summer for South Central Texas. But precipitation could go uh, either way. Right now, there's an equal chance of above or below normal precipitation. Of course, remember that, that July and August are our uh, driest, two of our three driest months of the year. So you know, if we are in significant drought, it's going to be hard to keep out of that. And aside from that, I just want to go ahead and let you know that uh, the Texas Weather Conference is going to go on again this year. Uh, we'll put out some information about that if you're interested in attending. But it's going to be the third weekend of, of September. Uh, in Arlington, Texas, at the University of Texas at Arlington. So that is going to be moving forward uh, on the third weekend of September. Uh, so if you have any questions, now is the time to ask, and just make sure that you guys remain particularly vigilant for severe weather and fire weather this year, and of course that isolated flash flow that could always happen. Thank you for attending.